time when family gets together to praise Jesus Christ, to worship Him, and to hear the preaching of God's Word. We're looking forward to it, and I'm looking forward to people stopping going away. It's like, yeah, this is that time of the year when everybody goes away. Just get it done, you know. Just go away and come back and stop it. But, uh, <laughs> stop going away. I know it's necessary sometimes that folks take their vacations and things this time of the year. But we do have some things that are coming up in the near future for which you need to be here. And one of those is our uh, vacation Bible school, two weeks, June the 15th through the 19th. And it's going to be a great time. Wild West Vacation Bible School. And um, the skits alone, I mean, just envisioning Tyler and Goo and Taj, TGT, and their skits. You know, Mr. T, Mr. T, and Mr. G doing Wild West skits. It's going to be good. And uh, we're going, we're just, we've got a lot of things that are going on. Full-time summer ministry begins tomorrow. If you're interested in doing some door-to-door -door evangelism, let us know. We've got it going on all the time, pretty much. And there's something going on all the time. We need a couple of things for Vacation Bible School. Uh, we need some folks that would commit to being able to be part of, um, part of, first of all, getting out flyers. Secondly, part of getting out and, um, let's see, um, part of being just there as workers. We need a lot of workers in DBS this, uh, this in the next couple of weeks. If you're able to be free and to be there, we can sure use your help for it. Also, the 19th, we will begin having Sunday night VBS in Miami Beach. And so we'll start having kids VBS, kids services on the Sunday evenings. And that will be kind of our beginning of having Sunday night services. If you'd pray about that and pray about maybe what part the Lord would have you to take in there. Good to have Tyler Cofty with us. He's our third intern. He's right back here on my left, your right. Get to know him. We've got Goo, and we've got, uh, where's that other guy? Taj. Well, the bow tie. I couldn't see you because you're bow tie. Uh, but we've got Taj, Tyler, and Goo. And these guys are going to be doing a lot of work on behalf of our ministry this summer. And so you be praying for them that God would give them the physical strength that they need, the personal discipline, and uh, that God would just give them a rewarding, fruitful ministry this summer. And then you come and be part of it. They're going to have opportunities. You'll have the opportunity to hear them preaching in the near future. We're going to have them preaching this summer. We'll have them teaching some Sunday school and doing a lot of different things. Well, you'll have the opportunity uh, to be able to just be part of the ministry that they have and part of the fruit of it. All right, uh, tomorrow night, Monday night, visitation. It's Memorial Day. And Taj and I discovered last year Memorial's a fantastic time. Memorial Day is a fantastic time to go door to door. And uh, most people celebrate all day long and they're not doing anything on Monday evenings. On Memorial Day, and so you come out, we'll have a great time. We, we just literally almost every home, people were home and they weren't busy, and they were happy to have us come by and invite them to church. So it'll be a good day for you to come out and do door-to-door -door visitation with us. Make sure to take the time and, and let your veterans know that you appreciate the sacrifices that they've made for our nation. Do we have other than Charlie? Are you our only military guy here? Mark, Mike, you're military too, weren't you? Yeah. So Mike, Charlie, who else? Oh, yeah, Dylan. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I knew that. So Mike, <laughs> Dylan, and Charlie, any other military guys we have here this morning? All right, make sure to let these guys know that you appreciate their willingness to sacrifice for our nation. What a wonderful day that we have tomorrow. And we, we are dangerously close to forgetting, dangerously close to forgetting what people have done so that we can have the rights that we have in our country and the freedom that we have. Don't take it for granted. Don't forget. Don't forget. Sometimes people look back too much, but I think sometimes we don't look often enough. And with regard to the past sacrifices that uh, valiant men have made knowing what they were doing when they did it. And I believe these men, knowing them personally, knew why they were going in the military. They didn't go in the military for college education or because they didn't know what else to do. They went to serve their nation. We appreciate you guys. We're thankful for you. We want you to know that. Uh... Teen activity Saturday is, we're going to the Bill Rice Ranch <laughs> Saturday? Is there a teen activity this Saturday? Uh, yes, there is. Okay, Bill Rice Ranch trip. That's what it says. <laughs> oh, I know what that's about. You need to get your registrations in for the Bill Rice Ranch trip. That's coming up in just a few short weeks, and it's going to be a fantastic summer. Matter of fact, we're gearing up for it early by having Wild West Vacation Bible School. 
will be so wild and western by the time we get there. I don't think they'll know what to do with us. <laughs> All right, that's it for announcements this morning. Todd, why don't you come up and help with this morning's offering? I think everyone here this morning is familiar with the offering in our church, so I won't say much about it. I just ask that you be mindful of the needs of the ministry and what it takes in order to be able to reach the lost for Jesus Christ and to be able to plant churches. And so be praying about those things as you give in the offering this morning. Let's pray, and we'll ask God's blessing on the offering. Father, thank you tonight for this grand opportunity that we have this morning, not tonight, to give. Father, I pray that you would bless each person that gives with the ability to have your grace in their lives to give. Lord, what a wonderful thing it is to be blessed enough to give. So as we do so this morning, we recognize your grace, your goodness to us. Father, we don't have anything that belongs to us or that comes from us, but everything we have is yours, including ourselves. We want this offering this morning to reflect a heart's attitude of gratitude that, Father, you gave yourself for us, but that we want to give our lives to you. We just pray that you'll bless and honor the offering this morning, that you'll have your way in it, and that you'll do a mighty work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. cross page 118 when I survey the wondrous cross
Bibles to John 12 while they're dismissing. John chapter 12. portion of scripture of course that we've been preaching through we've been preaching through the gospel of john and it's an important passage that we're coming to this morning and i think is incredibly practical in its application for us as believers hope you read your bible every day do you read your bible every day i hope you read it and deliberately study it and seek to memorize the scripture those things will help you spiritually and if you'll invest the time into it You'll find that every time you read it, God has something to say to you. And it's not a matter of being uh, brilliant. It's not a matter of, uh, you know, being able to get something, something else. It's a matter of being personal. God loves you. No one's told you here today. I hope that I can be the first to say to you today that God loves you more than you know. And as much as you know that God loves you, He loves you more than that. The more you realize God's love, the more you realize that it's just so vast and it's so personal and so wonderful. It's wonderful being in the Gospel of John because this is, this is the love, this is the love gospel, if you will. John, John is that uh, disciple who I think really grasped, really understood how much Jesus loved him and loved people. And as we looked at Lazarus being raised from the dead the last couple of weeks, one of the things that we learned was how much Jesus loved. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Matter of fact, when they sent to Jesus to come to Bethany because Lazarus was sick, they referred to him as Lazarus, whom thou lovest. And the Bible says, now Jesus loved Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It's amazing, isn't it? That God, who physically was the part of the Godhead, God the Son, who created the world, who is the answer answer to every problem that the world's ever had, the problem of sin, and who will one day in fierce, righteous anger judge the world, is capable of personally loving us. And not only capable of it, but my friend, that that is the reality. God loves you. He loves you personally. He doesn't love what you can be. He loves you, he loves you before he loved you before you were born. He loved you before you knew Jesus. So God loves you. Well, here in John chapter 9, 12, we're going to read our text this morning. We're going to read down to verse 11. And we're going to look at some things that are practical about how to respond to Christ's love. The Bible says in verse 1 of John 12, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone against the day of my bearing have she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And we'll pray, Father, this morning, help us to understand the Scripture and make good application by it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach a message this morning, and I don't always have a title for a message, but I like to just call this one First and Second Lease. First and Second Lease, and you could say, on life. So First and Second Lease, on life. Um, you ever heard the phrase, drive it like you stole it? About a car? <laughs> drive it like you stole it? Uh, wouldn't it be more appropriate in church to say, drive it like you rented it? Drive it like it's a rental? <laughs> um, Charlie. <laughs> He's not here. Never mind Charlie. Forget about him. He's in junior church singing. Isn't he doing a beautiful job singing? 
Sometimes Charlie rents cars. And um, he drives them like people that rent cars. I have a friend, and um, I have friends that say, never buy a rental car. I don't necessarily agree with that, but the reason they say never buy a rental car is because people drove them like they were rental cars. What does that mean? But it's not theirs, and they're leasing it, and so they're getting everything they can out of it, right? Let's just put it that way to be positive about it. Not because they're breaking the speed limit, not because they're whatever, but I do have a picture of a rental car person. I probably should be careful about sharing personal examples because you probably think badly of me. But I have a picture of a, a Ford um, Grand Marquis, Mercury Grand Marquis, and it was Charlie and Kyle and I went to the Bill Rice Ranch, but I have a picture of it on top of the mountain at the Bill Rice Ranch. I got it all the way up there. And um, I learned how to drive in the junkyard, and I can make a two-wheel drive car do things that would amaze you. I remember being in uh, college and being out in Colorado, and these big four-wheel drive trucks, you know, doing their rock climbing. I remember passing them, going up a mountain in my little two-wheel drive Toyota, and getting to the top of the mountain, everybody saying, how in the world did you get that thing up there? Well, I learned to drive in a junkyard. I can do things with cars that are pretty amazing. You give me a rental car, and I can show you some neat things. Why? <laughs> because it's not mine. But uh, <laughs> it's true, isn't it? When something doesn't belong to us, sometimes, sometimes we have less regard for it. You say, "Well, Pastor, you know that's why you pay for insurance and so forth." I know, I know. Don't argue with me about the rental car. I, I'm agreement with you. If you like to drive a rental car hard, so do I. Okay, we're in agreement. If you don't like to drive a rental car hard, um, I'm sorry, I offended you. <laughs> but anyway the bottom line is this when something doesn't belong to you you should treat it differently right now let me ask you a question do you treat things you borrow the way you treat things you lease <clears throat> pretty good question isn't it I don't think so. If I borrow something from somebody, I want to return it in better shape than the way I borrowed it. I remember being in high school and having my little two-wheel drive Toyota pickup. And uh, that's why I drove to school and I had a Chevelle I was working on, but I wasn't driving that at the time. But I remember the principal of my high school borrowing my pickup because he needed to get a new refrigerator. And he had a car, he didn't have a truck, so he borrowed my pickup. It was a small Christian school and that sort of thing was normal. And especially if you were one of the prices, we always had vehicles, my dad had a car lot. And so we were always loaning out vehicles. But he borrowed my truck, and I remember him bringing it back with a full tank of gas. And I, I, I loaned it to him with like a half tank. So he had driven it maybe 60 miles or so, and he brought it back with a full tank of gas. I told him, you didn't do that. You need to do that. And he said, you know, you always want to return something better than when you borrowed it. Because not only are you thankful that you borrowed it, but you want to show appreciation for it, right? So you want to take care of something that belongs to somebody else better, better care for it than if it's your, your own. Now, I hate to say it, but some Christians don't understand what it means to be bought with a price. There's a lot of Christians think that their life belongs to them, don't we, sometimes? Uh, have, it, it's understandable if somebody that's lost says, it's my life, and I'll do what I want with it, right? You ever heard somebody say, it's my life? You ever said, it's my life, maybe not in so many words, but, you know, it's not your life, it's mine, you're talking to a person? But you forgot something, didn't you? It's God's life. You forgot that you were made, right? You forgot God made you, and, and who owns who owns someone? The created or the creator? Who's the owner? The creator. The creator, creator, right? He made us, therefore he owns us. You know that the wicked, the Bible says, are reserved to God for judgment. Some people are so bothered by that, they don't understand. God made the wicked, if they want to be wicked, they're his to judge. He's right and he's righteous to judge the, the wicked. And not only because of their sin against Him, but because He's responsible for them. He made them. And God would not be a good God. He would not be righteous if He did not judge the wicked. But it's because He created them. Therefore, He's responsible for them. But when Jesus Christ is received in the life of a person, when you're born again and Jesus becomes your Savior, my friend, God has bought you with the blood of Jesus. He's bought your life. He's purchased you with Christ's blood. He's redeemed you. He's bought you back from His own wrath and in His mercy. And friend, it is not your life. But we are managers of our life, aren't we? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, listen, the bottom line is I can ask every one of you when you leave here today, would you mind coming out for soul winning tomorrow night? And you're the one that gets to make the decision on that. It's interesting, isn't it? Like every person here, with the exception of children, probably, if their parents said they're going, they're probably going. But uh, with the exception of that, every person here makes a decision on whether or not you'll be soul winning this week, don't you? Or make the decision whether you're not going soul winning. And if you don't go soul winning, I don't know what your reason would be. It could be that you cannot, but you wouldn't permanently be in, uh, take that position unless you thought it was your life. In other words, Matthew chapter 28, the last couple of verses, Matthew chapter 28 says what? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and though I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The last couple of verses of Mark are the same message. The first few verses in Acts before Jesus ascended up into heaven, His last words to His disciples were, Ye shall be witnesses unto Me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, God physically commanded believers to not just passively share the gospel, but to on purpose go forth to share the gospel on purpose around the world. Literally preach the gospel to every creature, the Bible says. So that's a command for Christians, for, for believers who are bought with a price, and so, if it is not my life, and my life belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm a steward, in a sense, I have a lease on life. Could we say that today? I don't want to take the analogy too far, but every one of us has been given a lease on life. And in, there, in, in our illustration here, Lazarus has been given a second lease on life. Now, you've heard, haven't you? How many of you have heard church tradition says that after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that he never smiled again because he'd been in paradise and so he was sad for the rest of his life because he'd been to paradise and now he had to come back to a sin-cursed, wicked world. How many of you have heard that? It's Catholicism. It's Catholic Church tradition. But most people have heard that. Most people have had, that have studied the life of Lazarus. Matter of fact, uh, I think, and I haven't checked this this morning, but I think if you pick up the average commentary, it'll tell that account that people say... Lazarus never smiled again. Friend, I don't believe that. First of all, because the Bible doesn't say it. Second of all, because I don't give much credence to any kind of church tradition. But secondly, because it is a great privilege to have a lease on life. Listen, I know Christians that say, you know what, Pastor, I just wish, I just long for the day when to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I long for the day when I'm going to be clothed with a house that's not made with hands eternal in the heavens, like 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. God, I just want to go to heaven. And I just want to tell you something, Christian. This life is an opportunity you'll never have in heaven. Get this, get this, understand this. Living this life is a chance you'll never have in heaven. Sometimes we have a really bad perspective. We think, well, I just wish I could live in a perfect world where everything's... You know, everything's perfect and not, not sin-cursed and where I don't have to deal with the problems in life. And we don't understand that our life is a privilege. It's a grand privilege. What do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor? Well, it matters forever, doesn't it, how we live in this life? After you get to eternity, my friend, you're not going to be able to do anything to alter your future. You know, the first thing in this life, if you're here this morning and you've never done it before, the first opportunity you have in this life is a chance to receive Jesus as your Savior. Every person is born physically, but the Bible talks about how that we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. But because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again, and because it's God's desire that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance, God has made it possible that every single one of us could be born spiritually. And that's one of the greatest opportunities this life affords. Matter of fact, it has to do with your future. You'll spend eternity somewhere. You'll be somewhere forever. You'll either be with God, You'll be with God in heaven or you'll be the enemy of God forever in hell, but you won't have any opportunity in that future. Listen, this life is an opportunity, and you have an opportunity in this life to receive Jesus as your Savior, and if you do not receive Jesus as your Savior, the day will come when it's no longer an opportunity, you no longer have a chance. Some people aren't even grateful for the life that God's given us where they have the opportunity to receive Jesus. You ought to be grateful for that. You ought to be thankful for this lease on life. It's not ours. We're managers of it, we're stewards of it, and we ought to be thankful that we have the opportunity to receive Jesus. But I know other Christians that just, um, they take one of two attitudes. Now, there's three attitudes, but they take one of two. They either take the attitude that says, well, you know, I'm thankful for my salvation, but 
you know, I've got to live my life. In other words, they take an attitude of personal ownership. They don't recognize Christ's lordship. Now, I'm not talking about lordship salvation here this morning. I'm talking about the fact that God has the right to your life. And that what God's will is for your life ought to be your will, and you ought to obey it. Many Christians, well, it's my life. I'm going to enjoy it. You know, I'm going to have what I want. You find out. You can, you can ask yourself some pointed questions, and you can find out. Who is Lord of your life? You really can. It's pretty simple. You can ask yourself, would I be willing to? Questions. You're single. You can ask the question, would I be willing to be single forever if that's what God wanted in my life? And it'll really tell you. It'll really tell you who, whose life you feel like it is. Who's the Lord of your life? I'm not talking about salvation here. Don't, don't get confused. Don't jump off. Lordship's a biblical doctrine. It's just not a salvific doctrine. Um, would I be willing to go anywhere for the Lord Jesus Christ? You'll find out. Would I be willing to sacrifice? Would I be willing to not have this? Would I be willing to serve in this capacity, in this situation? And you'll find out. You can ask yourself the question, if you fit in the category of the person who doesn't understand that it's his, our life is his, not ours. There are individuals that not only think that their life is uh, his and not ours, but there are individuals that think that our lives don't matter. How we live doesn't matter. In other words, all they wanted was to be saved, and after that they just don't really think that anything that we could do for God makes any difference. You ever met the person that says, you know, they take Esther, for an example, you don't remember Mordecai challenged Esther that if she would not play, would not have her part in God delivering his people, the Jews, then God would raise up someone else. And people say, well, you know what? If you don't do what God's called you to do, somebody else will do it. You know, that's not a scriptural biblical doctrine. That is not what's being taught in Esther. So many times Christians actually fall into the fallacy of thinking that their life doesn't make any difference. God created them. God made them. God has a will for their life, but it makes no difference whether they follow it or not. A preacher tweeted yesterday, and I liked it, what he said. He tweeted something to the effect that, oh, let me think about it. If I can quote it better than I'm about to. You can preach the gospel to people, and they may not be saved, but if you don't preach the gospel to them, they won't be saved. He didn't say it exactly like that, but it's really the truth. In other words, you can preach the gospel to the whole world, and the whole world may not be saved, but if you don't preach the gospel to the whole world, they won't be saved. You say, Pastor, no, 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 God will save who He wills, who He wants. Friend, that's, that's a lie. You study the Bible, and God uses three elements in people's salvation. He uses His Word, His Spirit, and His Messenger. You know, you think God just playing games, having us live life on earth? Like, listen, I'm going to have them preach the gospel, and it won't make any difference whether they do or not. I could just save whoever I want to anyway. I could just force people to be born again and force people to, to reject me. We'll make, no, friend, God gave your life a purpose. And the ultimate purpose in your life and the ultimate purpose in my life is to preach the gospel. I, I don't know where all the other things, the things that the Bible says to take no thought of, I don't know where they fall into, the, in, into place in your life particularly, but your purpose is to preach the gospel. Tony, take his gum from him. He's chewing it too loudly. Give it up, buddy. <laughs> you knew Tony was going to have a roll of paper towels. <laughs> Put in the paper towel. Did he already? Good job, Jonathan. Jonathan, you can chew it after church as loud as you want, okay? A hundred million times. Okay. Okay, so the question is this. Does it matter how I live? God's given me my life to live. It belongs to God, but does it matter how I live? And the answer is it absolutely does. You know, I know some people say, well, you know, if, if this person doesn't do what they're supposed to, someone else will do it. You know what? I'm going to just tell you something. It's, it's heartbreaking to me as a pastor that oftentimes because people don't do things, I have to do them. Because I realize I could be doing things that are more effective, but because I'm doing things that a lot of pastors shouldn't do, it keeps me from doing what a pastor should do. Sometimes I feel like a lousy preacher. I'm serious. I'm not joking about this. Sometimes I feel like a terrible preacher because I don't do what a preacher ought to do. And the reason is I'm doing what a lot of people that go to church ought to do instead of what the preacher should do. I'm just telling you a fact. It makes a difference what you do. 
In other words, if you don't do what you're called to do, someone else will have to in some instances, won't they? Won't they? So it matters how you live. Your life makes a difference. And if you're not what you should be, somebody else is going to have to step up in that position. And it's really important that every believer knows. I'm not talking about things. Knows what God wants them to do. How they ought to serve God. Because if they don't serve in that capacity, someone else will have to. You ever think about that? You ever wonder sometimes how things get done? Just I'm just talking about in order to worship God. You say, Pastor, not everything has to be done. I know, I know. The trash does not have to be emptied, right? In order for us to have a church service. But if you come to a place that has an overflowing trash can, and you're looking for a place where people love the Lord and do things right, you're probably not going to go there anymore. So yeah, the trash can needs to be empty, doesn't it? You know, there's some insignificant things in life, things that seem insignificant that have to get done. Everybody looks around and thinks somebody ought to do them. You know who empties the trash if no one else does? Mrs. Price. It's true. You know who cleans this church building if nobody else does? Mrs. Price. I'm serious about this. And I've had people say, you know, your wife shouldn't have to clean the church. And I agree with them. You know, if you knew how much work my wife does on a weekly basis, she's the hardest. I've, I've seen, I, I know many women that literally work so hard. But my wife is the hardest working person I've ever met. She does the books for three churches. If you think that's not a big deal, you should, you should see how much time it takes every week to do it right. She um, takes care of people's kids. She visits all the ladies in our church. She calls, she checks up on them, but she really goes after some. There are ladies in our church that she goes and visits every week and sits down and does Bible study and disciples them. And it takes a lot of time and effort. She goes on soul winning. She goes to teen activity. She goes to every church service. She does all kinds of things. And sometimes I think she shouldn't have to be the one that takes out the trash and cleans the floors. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complaining about anything here, Dan. I'm just telling you, if some people don't do some things, someone else has to do with them. You say, Pastor, well, maybe some of us should teach the Sunday schools and disciple people. I have no, no question about that. No doubt about that. I want to look at three people here in our text this morning. It's interesting. You say, what does this have to do with anything? To see here in this morning, I think it's really practical because we see three people who are serving God in different capacities. And we see one person who looks good to everybody. We know this is Judas, who actually is a thief and keeps the bag. Okay, so here we are in our text. Let's go to John chapter 12. And let's look at a couple of things here. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. According to the end of the text, people are coming... To, this is if you read Mark, they're coming to Simon the leper's house. They're coming to see Lazarus, not even Jesus, and they're believing in Jesus because of the testimony of Lazarus. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Look at verse nine. It says they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. And verse eleven says because that by reason of him speaking of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Now let me ask you a question: Did Lazarus have a ministry? He sure did. Yeah. What happened as a result of Lazarus' ministry? People got saved. People, People believed in Jesus. Jesus. That's fantastic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now let's look what Lazarus did for his ministry. Verse 2, the Bible says, There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Well, wouldn't you want that ministry? Mm -hmm. Now, anytime you include me, sitting at the table means eating, you know. Mm -hmm. And a good ministry, right? That's Lazarus' ministry. I'm not being silly. I'm not being facetious. But I'm going to tell you something. People believed in Jesus that would not have but for the ministry of Lazarus. And that's a fact. They came not just to see La Jesus, the Bible says, but they came to see Lazarus because he was raised from the dead. And because of Lazarus, the chief priest wanted to put him to de Lazarus to death. Try and kill a guy God's raised from the dead. That'd be a real pain, wouldn't it? <laughs> and God doesn't want him to die. It's not happening. I'm sorry. Um, but they want to put Lazarus to death because of Lazarus, people are believing in Jesus. Now, what did Lazarus do? What was his ministry? He sat at the table and ate dinner. And they said, were you dead? He said, yeah. What happened to you? Jesus raised me from the dead. 
Now I know he testified of Christ, and I guarantee he did it with a smile on his face. He wasn't sad about people believing in Jesus. Can you believe that this morning? Sure he was. He was rejoicing because he was bringing people to Jesus. I don't mean this in any way to be irreverent. You shouldn't take it to be so, but Lazarus reached people that Jesus did not reach in his ministry. I'm not being irreverent, and I'm not teaching something the Bible does not say, but people believe because of Lazarus. And that was an important ministry, wasn't it? You know, Jesus said the same thing. He was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, greater things than I, than I do, ye shall do, because I go unto my Father. And friend, if you do what Jesus wants you to do, you'll do things only you could do. I don't want to go too far. I don't want to say something that's blasphemous or irreverent. But you could almost say in this context, couldn't you, that even Jesus couldn't do? In other words, it was the work of Jesus. It pointed people to Jesus, but Lazarus was the one that had that ministry. And it was his, and it belonged to him, and that was his job. Good job, huh? Getting raised from the dead. I don't know about the dying part. <laughs> but the, the being raised from the dead part and the sitting at the table with Jesus it's a good job you know everybody's too hard on Martha aren't they everyone is way 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 too hard on Martha but Martha had a ministry too you know mm -hmm. now Martha's problem we know in other, in other texts of the scripture is that she wanted Mary to have her ministry right she said master tell Mary you know I, she's cumbered about with serving and Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet. Make my sister help me. And Jesus said, well, Mary's desired the best part. Now, you could argue, and I'm not going to argue against it, you could argue that, that Martha should have desired the best part, but let me ask you a practical question. Who would have served if Martha hadn't? Huh? Nobody. Had Martha had her little lecture from Jesus by this point? Yeah. Had she? Do you think she believed Jesus when she said when he said that Mary's desired the better part? Do you think she knew about that, about it being a good thing to sit at Jesus' feet? You think she did? Yeah. Then why in the world is she at Simon the leper's house serving tables? I'll tell you why, because they needed somebody to do that. And that was her ministry. And there's nothing wrong with Martha serving. She was a servant. She served. That's what she did, and that's what. Christ wanted her to do. And do you think that people believed in Jesus because of Martha's ministry? Yes. Yeah. They sure did. The place would have been a disaster without Martha serving. And God has ordained Him servants. And those servants are part of people coming to Jesus. Then there's Mary. There's Mary. And she's always showing off, isn't she? <laughs> Mary comes in with a ointment of spike nerd, 300 penny worth. They say is equivalent to a year's wages. I don't know. And the question is whose wages? You know, probably not mine. She comes in with this box of ointment. She comes to where Jesus is and, and nice shoes. And she takes her box. Of course, he's got his feet, you know, they need to be washed or whatever. And she takes her. Spike there, and she breaks the box and she puts it on his feet. She takes her hair and she wipes his feet with her hair. Now, that doesn't seem like anything that needs to happen, just to be honest with you here today. I'm not, I'm not being silly here, I'm serious. In other words, for things to go on that day, why in the world does 300 penny worth of ointment have to be wasted? But Mary understood that she only had a short opportunity in life to worship Jesus. She understood, hey, Jesus said in Mark, he said, the poor ye have with you always, but me ye have not always. See, Judas, who's there? And by the way, Judas is the head, head honcho of the disciples. He's the guy that's responsible for the management. As management, it's always the boss, you know, kind of thing. And he's the one that kept the bag. And John, John who uses words like beloved and the one whom Jesus loved. And John who's this warm, I mean, do you ever get the impression that John understood love really well? I mean, he's a guy that could really explain to you what love was. 
And Johnson said, John said, this he said because he was a thief. Not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and kept the bag. Now, it doesn't sound very loving. <laughs> Does it? I mean, does it sound like John's character? Judas said this because he was a thief and he kept the bag. He was the money keeper. And God the Holy Spirit used John to pen these words so carefully, so precisely as to help us to understand what's right and what's wrong about how we should serve Jesus. Mary served Jesus by worshiping Him. And she recognized that life was so short, she only had one chance. And the time that Jesus was with her was a, such a narrow window of time that she better just do everything she possibly could at the greatest expense, at the greatest cost to herself she possibly could because she'd never had that chance again. And Christian, can I say to you, all of us ought to live like Mary. When was the last time you served Jesus like it was your last chance? Listen, the fact of the matter is the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and it's appointed to every man to die. God has an appointment with each of us. One of my greatest fears is dying without having those moments when I gave Jesus everything I had. Without having the time when I was everything Jesus wanted me to be. You want to straighten him out, Mike? <laughs> No, just, just let it go, okay? Where's your soundboard? What's going know. on here? I don't know, man. I'm all mixed up. <laughs> yeah, you need your mixer. <laughs> Is it off now? All right, we're good. Okay. You just got to stop for these things because you can't go on anyway. We ready? Yes. Okay. So all of these individuals had a lease on life, didn't they? Judas had a lease on life. And you know what he did with his life? He ended up spilling himself on the field of blood. He ended up hating his life. He, ended up, he loved his life, and then he ended up losing his life. As near as I can tell about any person in the world, Judas is the man that we know for sure is in hell today and he was all concerned about spending life feeding the poor now out of the whole crowd didn't Judas really look like the best guy there was not a scenario where Judas did not look like the best guy there that's a fact we know the name Judas today is synonymous with betrayal it's synonymous with being a liar synonymous with all these things but that's because we know from retrospect what we couldn't see in person and in person the, the, the room is filled with the smell of this ointment, and Judas said, what a waste! But there were three people in the room who knew what they were called to do. Martha was called to serve, and she was everything Jesus wanted her to be. What a wonderful testimony she was of it. Mary was called to worship, and she, she worshipped Jesus with everything she had. She gave Him all she had. She worshipped Him, and by bowing down at his feet and giving him the place, raising him up in a way that really nobody else worshipped him, even though he deserved it. And Lazarus served Jesus by testifying of the resurrection. And people believed because of Lazarus that didn't even believe because of Jesus. And all of them had a lease on life. All of them had a chance. All, every one of them had a chance to live in other places Jesus said about Mary that what she, what she had done would be remembered forever. It's Mark chapter 13, the Bible says that. It's not a bad thing, Christian, to want to do something that lasts forever. You hear me this morning? I'm not talking about a memorial. I'm not talking about a foundation that gives homage to you. I'm talking about doing something that matters forever. And it's okay for you to want to do something in your life that will make a difference for eternity. It's not just okay, it's what you should do. God's given you a lease on life. You literally have a life that doesn't belong to you. But it is a life that you're responsible for. And you ought to live it for the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to live it out. I like the way Mary lived it here, don't you? 
She said, I only have so much time. There's only so much I can do, and I'm going to do everything for Jesus. God will show you if that's you. Did you know that? God will show you. Maybe no one else will understand why you're doing what you're doing. I don't know how many times I've had people say, you know what? You've got to be careful about burning out in the ministry. You've got to be careful about giving everything to the ministry because you won't have anything left when you retire. I understand where they're talking. I can understand being responsible and not being liable for other people, but you know, usually that's a cop-out for not serving Jesus. I get so tired of hearing preachers talk about burning out. It is sick and tired of that. You don't burn out in the ministry. No way, no how. I understand that God created our bodies physically to need rest and those sort of things, but the ministry won't burn you out, my friend. If you're faking it, well, if you're doing it like a Judas, it'll burn you out. But if you're doing it like a Mary, you won't burn out of the ministry. Remember when Jesus was at the well by Samaria and he's speaking to that woman? And the disciples had gone to town to get him something to eat. And he was so fatigued he couldn't go to town himself, so he sat down by the well. And after preaching the gospel to that woman and all these people that came out of Samaria, they came to him and said, Master, eat. And he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And they, 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 they started counseling and asking each other, did somebody give him something to eat? And he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. You know, if you're burnt out, it's because you're not serving Jesus, not because you are. Anything else will wear you out. Anything else will tire you out. Anything else will burn you out. But if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, you'd be amazed at what God will give you the ability and sustainment to do. Mary wasn't worried about burning out. She was worried about a loss of opportunity. Your Martha... Can you imagine Martha? She learned her lesson here because she didn't do it, right? She didn't say, Master, Lazarus is eating. Why doesn't he serve so I can sit at the table? Well, seriously. That's what she said when Mary was sitting with Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to him. Why didn't she say it about Lazarus? Well, you say, you understand it's the culture of the day. No, they'd already superseded the culture by knowing Jesus. See, culture is the world of wickedness. And you'll notice that you can say, well, cultures of the day disrespected women. All culture disrespects anybody who's weak and takes advantage of them. But my friend, I want to say this to you. Jesus has never disrespected women. And these individuals, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, when the Bible said Jesus loved them, it's, an, it's a term of equality there. He loved Mary, he loved Martha, and he loved Lazarus. And I promise you, Jesus wasn't above culturally having Martha sit down at the table with him. Jesus didn't care about the culture and the customs of the day. That's why he ate with publicans and sinners, if you'll remember. He cared about people. And I could see Martha saying, you know, why does Lazarus get to sit down? Well, I'll tell you why Lazarus got to sit down, because his sitting down there was all he needed to do to point people to Jesus. And that's what Jesus wanted from Lazarus. Christian, you and I need to learn to serve Jesus without saying, why aren't they? You, you know, you ought to enjoy being a Martha if God's called you to. Martha had a wonderful ministry. Matter of fact, we know who she is, don't we? Here she is again doing what Martha always did. She was a host, hostess. She served people. She made them comfortable. And I'm telling you, without Martha, Jesus wouldn't have had the ministry he had that day. There was, La there was Mary... She needed to show an example of how to worship Jesus, and Jesus used her for an eternal example of a person worshiping while they can. And she needed to do what she did that day. I promise you, she was led of God. And Lazarus needed to sit down with Jesus at the table and eat. And he needed to do what he did that day. And Christian, all we need to do is just understand ownership, don't we? We've got a lease on life, but it's short. We need to think like Mary and say, what am I going to do with my life? I need to serve Jesus while I can. We need to think like Martha and think, what am I going to do with my life? I need to serve Jesus while I can. We need to think like Lazarus, who would say, I've got a second lease on life. I need to serve Jesus while I can. And Christian, every one of us ought to think, I need to serve Jesus while I can. Shouldn't we? Because we've been given a lease on life. It's not ours. I don't want to go too far with this, but I talked about driving a rental car in a way you don't drive your own car. Part of the reason is my car won't go like a rental car will. Okay. <laughs> Something will fall off or break. Now, um, 
But let me just tell you something. If this life isn't mine, I really don't need to worry too much about it. And that's a fact. I'm not talking about doing things wrong. I'm not talking about tearing up this body. I'm not talking about destroying it. I'm not talking about deliberately doing destruction to it. But you know what? I had to just say, well, you know, if God wants it, I'm going to go for it. I mean, if it's God's will and that's how I'm supposed to serve Him, then I'm going to do it. You know, friend, on occasion in my life, God has shown me things that were way beyond what I could do with my life. Listen to me now. God will show you things in your life that are beyond what you could do. But it's what God wants, and He'll give you the grace, and it's His life. And if He wants you to do it, you most certainly can. And you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to say, what will happen to me if I... You know, sometimes it's a matter of giving. That was Mary. Can you imagine if Mary was economical in her giving? She wouldn't have given to Jesus for one thing. And for another thing, she probably wouldn't have given at all. But the fact of the matter is, she said, you know what, I want to give to Jesus. I may not have another chance. You know, Christian, I don't know your life. I don't know what God's showing you. But if God shows you, you ought to give. You ought to give God whatever He shows you. Just give it to Him. It would be a real shame if you died and still had it. I'm serious about this. It would be a tragedy. You say, no, I give it to my kids. Yeah, I mess up their lives too. Seriously. Sometimes we think leaving somebody something will solve their problems. No, teaching someone to know Jesus will solve their problems. A long time ago, I got over wanting my parents to leave me anything. I hope my parents use everything they have for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I don't worry about, oh, what if they give this to these people or this church? Or what if somebody takes advantage of them? Man, God help them to do what God wants with what God's given them. It's His. And so is their life. Be like a Mary and give. Sometimes it's service. Thank God for Martha's attitude as she served. What an attitude. You think about that? Here she is, and Lazarus is sitting there, and Mary's getting all the attention, and all she's doing is waiting on tables. And it's not even her house. It's Simon the leper's house. Thank God for Martha. That she didn't say, why am I the one that always has to? Why isn't anyone else doing this? Thank God for her. She understood her life was to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for Lazarus. He didn't say, I don't want to be here. These people want to kill me. I, this is dangerous for me. He said, you know what? Lord giveth, Lord taketh away, and I've had it twice. <laughs> I'm sure enough going to use this one for Jesus. And he lived his life for him. And then think about yourself. Say, God, what am I? God, the last thing I want to be is a Judas, thinking that money that isn't mine should be mine because I'm a thief. Judas literally had stolen his life. God gave it to him, and he thought it was his own. He thought he could have it for himself. He tried to, tried to steal it. You want to be a Judas. But you could be a Lazarus. Testify of Jesus if that's what God wants. You could be a Martha. And by the way, you shouldn't be envious of Lazarus if you are. You could be a Mary, and you shouldn't be envious of Martha and Lazarus. And, and Lazarus and Martha shouldn't be envious of Mary if you are. God sometimes just gives people the ability to give. And they can just give. But you ought to know what you are. And Christian, it would be a real shame this morning if you had no idea, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it just be too bad this morning if you knew that your life belongs to God but you have no idea what God wants with it? But that could be the way it is, actually. It could be that this week you're going to live your life more like Judas than Mary, Martha, or Lazarus and it's because you really don't even know what God wants. Well, that'd be too bad, wouldn't it? What are you? What does God want? Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've taught us this morning. I ask you to help us to live it out in serving Jesus. Thank you for the lease you've given us of this life. And Lord, I pray that you would show us each and every one exactly what it is that you want from us, what our calling is, what our position is, and how we're to serve. Father, help us not to look at the lives of other people like a thief does and think of how we could have that ourselves if it wasn't given to Jesus. Father, 
Help us not to look at our lives as in comparison with others, but Lord, help us to know what our opportunity is and what we could do, and help us to be willing just to go all out, living for Jesus. We pray it in His name. Amen. We're going to have an invitation here this morning. I've got Chris and Taj are going to be at the back of the room. I don't have a piano player this morning, so we're going to play without the piano. But we're going to sing page uh, 240, I believe it's 249, Just As I Am. I want to explain the invitation before you stand to you very quickly. The invitation is a time when we invite you. God showed you something from His Word to respond. It might be here this morning that you it's never occurred to you that God gave you your life and that one day you'll answer to Him for it. First, you'll answer for whether or not you've ever received Jesus as your Savior. You don't even, if you don't even understand that this morning, these men standing back here have got Bibles in their hands and they can show you how you can know for sure with full confidence that Jesus is your Savior, and that you have eternal life. You can settle that matter. That's the first most important thing every person has to do with the life God's given them. But you're here this morning and you say, you know, Pastor, I know I fit in some one of these categories. I don't want to be a Judas. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I don't know if I'm a Martha or a Mary or a Lazarus. I really don't know what my calling is. Well, friend, don't you think maybe you ought to get to know that pretty soon? Because God's given you a lease on life. You hear this morning, pray and ask God's help. And then promise God, God, I, I'll be what you want me to be. If, if I'm a Martha, let me serve. Start serving. God, I'll testify of Jesus. Start testifying. God, this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give what I have to the Lord. I'm going to give everything I have. I'm just going to sacrifice because I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to give it again. And then give it. Well, God's spoken to you about you do business with Him in invitation. Let's stand and turn to page 249. We're going to sing Just As I Am. That's where God, that's where you meet God, just, just where you're at. You plead the blood of Jesus Christ here this morning. As we sing this song this morning, if these aren't the words of your heart, then you do business with God. If you need to pray with someone, Taj is back there, Chris is back there. They've got Bibles and they'd be willing to help you with some Bible answers. You're here this morning and you just need to do business with God alone. Kneel right where you at and do business with Him instead of singing in the invitation. But you let God have His way with you. God has spoken to you, not for no reason. God has spoken to you so that you could respond to Him. Just as I am, we're going to sing without the piano this morning. And as we sing, you do business with God or you sing the song. Just as I am with say oftentimes we do close the service but the invitation is always open God's always inviting you to come and if God's spoken to you specifically about something in your life maybe maybe sometimes when God speaks to you it begins to open up more questions than answers in your life uh, just remember this God's word has all the answers and God's people can help you with those answers if you need to see somebody talk to someone or ask a question we don't mind questions even if it seems to you like a hard question or Sometimes even a question, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, or I feel bad saying this. Go ahead, and we'll open a Bible, and we'll look at the answer for it. We don't know everything, but we've got a book that does. God has the answer for you, for your life. God loves you, and He wants you to serve Him. He wants you to live for Him. And you'll never be happier, you'll never be more fulfilled than being what God wants you to be. So if you need some help with that, you need just some counsel or even accountability, come, come talk to us after the service today. I'd be happy to. My wife would be happy to if you're a lady. We've got time for you. We're here all day on Sundays, literally. And we might be at Taco Bell for a while. You can find us there. But we're here all day, and we've got time for you. And God loves you, and if we can be a help, we sure want to. 
we're going to dismiss with a word of prayer. Brother Al, would you dismiss us? Thank you, dear Lord, for the message that we heard today and the opportunities that we have. Help us to take the opportunities and use the things that you've given us to further your work here on earth in your kingdom in this church. I pray that you'll help us go forth this week and carry the word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Team this evening, we're taking just a little um, excursus. This isn't part of our Exodus series and this isn't part of our Hebrews series. But I just want to preach a message about memorials this evening because I think it's an appropriate time to do that. And so Exodus chapter 17 tonight, and we'll look in our text. We're willing to be able to learn some things about the heart of God. It's always important to know what God thinks, isn't it? To know how Amen. God thinks. And God's not hidden himself from us. He hasn't hidden his face from us. He wants us to know how He thinks, and He wants us to live for Him. And, and, it, and it's not a great mystery, but sometimes I think because we're not interested in what God thinks, we forget who God is. So we're going to look this evening, beginning in chapter 17 of Exodus, and verse 8. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. We'll pray, and then we'll look at a couple of other texts this evening and really look at memorials. The Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people at the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, The Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war from Amalek with Amalek from generation to generation. Father, this evening as we look at this memorial that you wanted your people to have as well, Father, as what you wanted your people to forget, Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember the victories that you've given us in a way, Father, that will help us not to forget you. And Lord, in a way that will keep us from going back and in defeat. Thank you for what you'll do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a memorial passage. I think memorials oftentimes are very important. It's important not to forget. It's amazing how quickly we forget or how quickly even history can be rewritten. Things of the past that have happened, how quickly individuals can forget. It surprises me. It shouldn't, I know, but it surprises me how quickly uh, people as a nation forget some of the evils that are done and forget the reasons that individuals have died. It's, it's very sad to me and um, it, it's hurtful. And it certainly would be more so to individuals who sacrifice their lives that people forget the sacrifices that are made. It's important to remember and especially important to remember what God says He wants us to remember. God wants us to remember His law. God wants us to remember what He's brought us from. Not so that we could go back to it, but so that we could know how evil it was and how we ought to go back to it. This matter of Amalek is uh, it's mentioned a couple of times in the Scripture. If you want to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 25, maybe get a little better, little uh, in additional information on just exactly what the Amalekites had done. Israel's in a weak place. They're not a they're not a nation that goes out to war or conquering. They're just simply a nation that's been delivered and been delivered from bondage and from captivity it's an evil thing at any time to prey upon the weak or upon individuals who uh, are innocent it's an evil thing I think to prey on others anyway for the purpose of spoiling them and to take from them and that's precisely what the Amalekites wanted to do they wanted to discomfort them or cause them to be frightened and afraid and uh, it was an evil thing that they had done to Israel. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. 
God is reminding His people. He said, "Remember what Amalek did to thee by the way when you were come out forth out, when you were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God." Well, that's a pretty sound indictment against any person, isn't it? In other words, he attacked the feeble. He would have attacked the elderly, the individuals that were least able to defend themselves. He, the Amalekites took advantage of them and attacked them. They attacked the most vulnerable, the people that had fallen back or behind were at the back of, of, the, of, the, of the travel as the people were exiting or as they were moving in the wilderness. And the Amalekites came behind and, and attacked those people who were both vulnerable, who were feeble, and uh, did an evil thing to them when they were faint and weary. Anybody who fears God understands the value of a soul. Anyone who fears God understands the value of a soul. That's a fact. Um, I don't have a hard time um, as an American when our country interferes in the affairs of other nations. I know some people say, well, we just need to stop being, you know, some kind of a big bully of a nation that, that bosses other nations around. You know, I believe this with all my heart, and it doesn't matter if there's one or two individuals in high places that spoil the reason for it. But I believe that God-fearing people have a responsibility to protect the innocent in any society. That's why abortion is such a troubling issue in our nation, why it's going to be the destroying and downfall of our nation. When people stand by and allow the destruction and attack of the most innocent, there's evil, on the, uh, uh, evil blood on the hands of a nation that allows that. And God will judge our nation. We will... Uh, sadly, we'll come to the place where we will no longer uh, be known as a God-fearing nation or even as a great nation. We simply will be judged, and that's that's the result of wickedness. the The only answer to that, the only antidote to that, is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and change the hearts of individuals, because we've got wicked hearts. I remember for the first time I ever heard anyone say this uh, when we were in the first Gulf War. Melissa and I were eating a hot dog at Costco in Boca Raton, and we were kind of new to Southeast Florida, and so we're kind of new to, to extreme liberalism. Uh, just It just was something that, especially particularly uh, Palm Beach County is an extremely liberal area. And uh, we were sitting in Costco, smiling and eating our hot dogs, minding our own business, sort of, and an elderly guy, he seemed like a pretty nice guy, struck up conversation with us, and somehow started commenting about, you know, we were having, you know, that we'd had all the uh, the stock market uh, crash and the major recession around that time, and around 2000. And um, he started talking about that. Of course, he would be an individual that had probably lost a lot financially uh, in the stock market and so forth in investments. And he was infuriated about that, very upset about it. Matter of fact, that was the major motivation. And his um, take on the whole thing was that it was because we had gone to war. Now, I remember pretty clearly, and if you're one of the conspiracists that says that 9-11 never happened, I, I don't have any help for you, but you're beyond disrespectful to the lives of those that were lost and to the people who um, have lost their lives. And honestly, don't, don't even talk to me about it because I don't have any use for your opinion about it. Uh, honestly, you, you're beyond... You're beyond helping if you take that attitude. And I know so-called Christian people that do take that position that 9-11 never really happened. It was something that was caused by the Illuminati and by George Bush, you know, blew up the, the trade towers, the World Trade Center, and all that nonsense. Anyway, all that aside, this was an individual that said, well, if we just leave them alone, they wouldn't mess with us. You know, one of these pacifist nations. And, of course, he didn't understand Islam, but this man was Jewish. And it sort of boggled my mind a little bit, baffled me a little bit, that a Jewish person would say, you know, leave them alone and don't interfere, when every Muslim nation in the world wants to obliterate God's people, the Jews. That's just a fact. That's what they want to do. If they could, all they want, I mean, they don't really want much. All they want is for every living Jew to be dead and then all the Christians to be dead. That's all they want. I mean, honestly, that's... I know Muslim is a gentle, peace-loving nation, and all they want is for every 
infidel, which would be Christian and particularly Jews, to be killed in a cruel, terrible way. So, he said, you know, it's all about oil. Well, I don't want to get political, but I don't buy that. I'll tell you this, it is an oil for the people that I know that volunteered to go into the military and to give their lives. It wasn't about oil for them. It was about evil. And evil things that were being done to those that they loved. And they went through terrible evil. And of course, a person who makes a statement like it's all about oil and it's all about money, maybe all about that for you, but it wasn't about that for the people that gave their lives. And he said, are you a bushy? I had never heard of Bush he was before, but he meant, did you vote for George W. Bush? I did vote for George W. Bush. I don't care who knows it. I, <laughs> I'd like to shake the man's hand. I don't agree with the man on a lot of economic issues, but he was the last good president we've had that valued human life. And I believe that, I believe God smiled on our nation because of that for the time. Who cares about his economic policies? God can take care of the economics. And uh, anyway, but he was trying to insult me. But I told him, I said, you know, the Muslims want to wipe out Israel. They, Saddam Hussein wanted to wipe out every Jew alive because they're Jewish. And I said, God-fearing people ought to do something about that. And he strongly disagreed with me about it. He said, no, you know, you know let them kill themselves. That's what they want to do. It's hard for me to fathom because to me, I would feel like if I were Jewish, I would feel like letting them kill the Jews was a real threat. When you love money a lot, you become tainted in your thinking and you, you forget. You forget. A lot of people forget. A lot of people have forgotten. Great sacrifices. Great sacrifices that others have made in order to combat evil and to do something to stand for the innocent. And they've forgotten how evil it is to prey on or to take advantage of the weak. And that's precisely what had happened here is God's people had exited Egypt. They weren't a war-monging nation. They weren't a fighting nation. Everywhere they went, they were frightened of the people there. Matter of fact, God kept them in the wilderness because they weren't ready to go into Canaan. They weren't ready to fight yet. And so we hear the weakest of them were attacked by the Amalekites. And God is a merciful God, and He's also a God of great wrath and judgment on the wicked. And it's a very personal thing, according to Deuteronomy chapter 25, for God, that Amalek attacked Egypt. He smote the hindmost of thee, verse 18, even all that were feeble behind thee, and when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. He didn't fear God, and he didn't care about hurting man. Therefore, God said, It shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And then it says, Thou shalt not forget it. <laughs> God said, I don't want you to forget that you're supposed to cause Amalek to be forgotten. That's exactly what a memorial is. A memorial is a deliberate, on-purpose remembrance of something you don't want to forget that shouldn't be forgotten. And God plainly told His people, I do not want you to forget what Amalek has done. Now, uh, fast forward with me. I think you know where we're going here, but fast forward with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Israel finally has a king. No longer is it said about Israel that there was no king in Israel in those days. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They rejected God as their king, but they had chosen Saul, and Saul was a good king. He was a goodly king. 1 Samuel chapter 15, Samuel, God's priest, is also still living, and God has a message through Samuel to Saul. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember, I remember that which Amalek did Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. 
Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tel Ahem, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge, that they destroyed utterly. Then came, at the word, came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, Repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, he cried unto the Lord all night. I know we understand what Saul's sin here was. Saul's sin was rebellion. Saul's sin was an unwillingness to obey God. But I want to ask a practical question. The practical question is, what caused Saul to make that rebellious decision? What put Saul in a position that he made the decision to disobey God and not to utterly destroy the Amalekites? And I'll submit to you this evening that Saul forgot. Saul didn't remember. You say, Pastor, well, when Samuel came to Saul with the message from God, Samuel said to Saul about God, I remember what the Amalekites have done. I remember it. Yes, God for didn't forget. Now, Christian, get this this evening when you think of memorials. Remember this. God never forgets. God never forgets. It's astonishing to me how oftentimes individuals who God delivers from a circumstance or a situation, and I believe uh, they, they personally have met with God and God has warned that individual, never go there again. Never do that again. Never involve yourself with this again. It's amazing how clear sometimes we get a message from God and then how easily we forget. We're guilty of it, aren't we? It's in us oftentimes to forget what God said, always remember. Now, Christian, know this. God never forgets. Can I say that enough? God never forgets. Ever. Anything. And God said, I want you never to forget what the Amalekites have done, and I want the rest of the world to forget the Amalekites ever lived. And God wasn't unclear about that. And by the way, God was right. And God was just and God was holy. They did not fear God and they had committed evil against the people whom God loved. Now I find comfort in the fact that God doesn't forget, don't you? Amen. You know, David said in Psalm 37, he said, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down as the grass and wither as the green herb. See, God doesn't forget evil. The Scripture says that it rains on the just as well as the unjust. But the thing that you and I must remember is that those individuals who are not righteous, who are not justified, God remembers their sin. And here's some application, my friend. God wants to forget the sin of the righteous. God wants to forget your sin. He talks about not remembering iniquities anymore. The Scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. God wants to forget the sins of those who he has made righteous. But friend, the unrepentant, God never forgets. Sometimes we worry, we concern ourselves, we are so upset about injustice in life and in this short life, and we have forgotten that God has not forgotten I am so thankful for God's mercy in my life. I'm so thankful that every time that I've deserved it, God has not utterly destroyed me. Sorry. So thankful for that. So many times I have just felt, and sometimes it's a little bit of a, you know, um, remorseful, if you will, pity party. God, you should just kill me. But the fact of the matter is that God forgives. And He, does, and he, and he forgets 
in that sense on purpose. But friend, when it comes to unconfessed, unrepentant evil, God never forgets it. You know God never forgets the actions in the life of a believer. Some Christians have a hard time with this. They have a hard time understanding how we can be positionally justified or righteous and understanding how that God could judge His people. Let me just say this. Judgment is only for the wicked. You study the Scripture and you'll find that judgment is only for the wicked. Judgment is not for the righteous. But God judges everything you ever do. Everything you'll do from the moment you're saved on forward, God will judge it. The Bible says that the works that you do are going to be burned. They're going into the fire. That's judgment. Fire's judgment. And God's going to judge everything you do in your life, and it, either what you do will be destroyed, or if it's for Christ, it'll be gold, silver, precious stones. It'll last. But it will be judged. Christian, don't forget that your life will be judged. You'll be spared from the fire because of the blood of Jesus Christ, but you might be the only thing that survives the fire. Because God does not forget. God does not forget wickedness. Do we, hit, do we, do we understand this this evening? But Saul fell. And it seemed like such a terrible judgment against Saul. Did anybody here ever feel like, wow, I mean, that was really harsh. Saul did a pretty good job destroying the Amalekites. Matter of fact, he was pretty merciful to the Kenites. Saul said, when God's people were coming through and they were vulnerable and they were weak, you treated them kindly. And we haven't forgotten that. So the Amalekites are going down. God wants them killed. So get, a, get out away from them. Separate yourself from them so that you won't be killed with them. I'm thinking from the perspective of an Amalekite at this point, I would have uh, converted to be a Kenite, or at least pretended to be one. I would have gotten out with them. But for whatever reason they did, the Amalekites didn't fear God, you see. They weren't a bit afraid of anything God could do. They weren't afraid of God's king, Saul. And so they remained. The Kenites obviously did fear God. They feared God in the past, and they feared God at this time, and they left. And Saul went in, and he destroyed everything, everything that was bad the godless people who didn't fear God except for Agag. He destroyed the sheep, the camel, the oxen, everything that wasn't good, but he kept all the good stuff. You have to ask yourself, why? Why? You say, Pastor, because Saul thought he knew better than God. Friend, isn't it amazing how quickly we can forget Had God taken care of Saul? When thou was little in thy sight, God said about Saul. God taken Saul from being little, a little seven-foot guy to a big seven-foot guy. He made him a great king. He'd taken him from being chosen to be king of a scattered remnant, really, of a people to unifying a nation, building up some military strength and being a great leader. God had taken Saul a long ways. And Saul saw sheep, camels, oxen. And he said, there, there's nothing wrong with the sheep, the camel, and the oxen. And I've always thought Saul had good logic here. I hate to waste stuff, don't you? I mean, the people, they were just evil. They didn't fear God. But the sheep, the camel, and oxen, they might have been God-fearing for all I know. They would have been if they'd been killed. And I believe Saul a little bit when he said, we kept these for the Lord. We kept these for sacrifices. But Saul forgot that God did not want the Amal Amalekites remembered at all. Can you imagine here you come, come up on a you know, nice looking camel, double humper, and uh, come rolling up to your, to your friends. Wow, nice camel. Where did you get that? You know, he's a Ferrari brand. <laughs> well, you know, when God destroyed the Amalekites, and He just brought up their memory. What good camel raisers they were. 
In order for the Amalekites to be forgotten, everything they had needed to be destroyed. And if Saul had just remembered God, he would have known that. Now you and I know God can give camels, can't he? Saul had to have known that, didn't he? Did Saul know that? Sure. He came from being an average Joe, bashful seven foot tall guy, awkward in his own skin, to being a great king in the world. And he knew God could take you from rags to riches. And yet he, camp, cut, he saw camels and they made him forget. Now let's, let's just make some application and then we'll try to remember it and go home. Isn't it amazing how the sin or the circumstance that we say we'll never go back to? Isn't it amazing how fast you can get yourself in the same place you were before? It is amazing, isn't it? All right, let me just say two things. God never forgets. And you'd better remember. God never forgets. And you'd better remember. Or you'll find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be. And you'll never remember how you got there. That's precisely what happened to Saul. Father, help us never to forget that you don't forget. And we better remember. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.